So to wrap things up, and with that, as your real introduction, not a bad segue, uh, we have with us Brett Winton, who is Arts Director of Research, who previously was the founder of IMB Consulting and worked with Kathy for over a dozen years, including time at Alliance Bernstein as the analyst. And so I think it's appropriate that we kind of start with the hard-hitting question that, and that the uh, community that we source these from wanted to know. This was the number one question. Uh, and it is, ARC talks a lot about disruptive innovation, which sounds a lot like Clayton Christensen. So how much does that really play into the research process and the ideology behind the work at ARC? Uh, so Clayton Christensen wrote The Innovator's Dilemma. Um, and we were certainly inspired by um, that book. The, the, the framing that I like to think of <clears throat> with disruptive innovation is disruptive innovations are innovations that allow um, companies that are less well capitalized to displace an incumbent that's much better capitalized and sees them coming, um, despite the fact that the incumbent sees them coming. And, and that's the framing that Clayton Christensen provided. We don't actually subscribe necessarily to the, the mechanics that he does for how you define disruption. All of his disruption has to happen from the low end. He famously said that, or thought that the iPhone was not disruptive because it came in at a high price point. Uh, instead, we kind of marry Clayton Christensen's uh, theory of, of what, how do you classify disruption with what we call general purpose technology uh, theory. And there's academic theory behind that. Kathy mentioned it. Um, the technologies we're interested in follow steep cost declines. They cut across sectors. Uh, and, and they're themselves platforms of innovation. Um, these criteria lend themselves to technologies that are um, you know, macroeconomically impactful, but they also uh, tend to be overlooked by both the executives that are sitting in the decision-making roles within incumbent companies uh, and overlooked by, we believe, the investment community. And so they create really, in our view, massive pricing inefficiencies that allow us to put client money into assets at really attractive levels. So with that as really the framework then, how do you really identify the platforms and how do you, how do you identify that, that they're going to reach the growth of the opportunities that you anticipate? So um, we, there's a, a few ways that we, we look at things differently than others do. Um, Kathy mentioned some of them. For, for one thing, we have an intentionally longer time horizon. If you think about what happens with a, a, a platform that has a steep cost decline, that doesn't manifest in three months. And um, because it doesn't manifest in three months or six months, traditional analysts often aren't incentivized to do the work to figure out where it's going to go. Sometimes even the executives themselves aren't. I mean, the, the median uh, CEO like tenure is five years. Why would he bother to, to plan something that's going to go beyond what he's going to get paid for? Uh, and so we have a, a, our 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 top-down research starts at five years forward, and even our bottoms-up work on the companies themselves, we value the companies as we believe they will be valued by the marketplace over five years, not trying to identify, oh, the catalyst is four months away. So that cost decline work, as Kathy alluded to, is based on what's called Wright's Law, uh, which um, for uh, the, the formulation of it is for every cumulative doubling of production, you actually have a consistent percent cost decline. Uh, Kathy also mentioned, you know, our analysts are signed by technology sector. And then we also have an open attitude. So platforms of innovation, you often suffer from a failure of the imagination as to how big this can possibly be. To guard against that, you have to talk to the people using it. You have to use these technologies yourself. Uh, and so um, those, uh, that work then informs the ultimate kind of uh, market modeling that we do and then translates down to the security level. So one of the one of certainly the positions that is associated with ARC the most and the spaces that we cover in a very different way is the electric vehicle space. Um, and so Kathy mentioned a lot about the convergence of artificial intelligence and robotics. Um, but with that and with the growth that we project, what would the position be relative to lithium production and the capacity uh, of lithium in the use of electric vehicles? Okay, so I'm going to heavily cite Sam Corus's work here. So if I get something wrong, Sam, come running up from the back of the room and <laughs> tackle me. Um, but uh, so we think that, we believe that uh, by 2023, 26 million electric vehicles will be being sold. Um, it's actually a pretty simple analysis to get there in that we do Wright's Law cost decline modeling. We think 
in the early 2020s, you're going to walk into a showroom. On the right, you're going to have a Toyota Camry. On the left, you're going to have a more performative vehicle uh, that you don't have to take to the gas station every day and that saves you money over time. And it's going to be an electric vehicle and it's going to cost less. So it would be a tremendous surprise if consumers continued to buy the more expensive thing that's worse off. I mean, there will be some that do it, like people still buy vinyl records and they listen to them, um, but m the entire market's gonna invert over to electric vehicles. So having done that cost decline work using rights law, then we sought to de-risk it. It's like, what could get in the way of this? So you have to say, well, how long does it take to build out the battery factories? Uh, how many can, can you build? What's the capital requirements for that? How about the raw materials? And so Sam went through the whole raw materials stack. Lithium is not going to be a critical path factor in our view. It's widely abundant. Um, right now, pricing of it suggests it's in sh short supply. But um, if you look at the time it takes to, to bring a mine online, it's going to be um, sufficient to, to uh, accommodate all the electric vehicles we anticipate. And then from a style perspective of, of the kinds of companies we're interested in, uh, commodity producers typically aren't it. We look for companies with strong barriers to entry. Um, you know, there's some interesting assets in the space, but it's not our kind of company. So the kind of company that is our kind of company is Tesla. You heard even uh, Eric reference uh, the sentiment scores that Bloomberg produces. It's, I don't think it's much of a secret uh, relative to news headlines. Why do you believe, given the upside that we see, uh, that Tesla is such a polarizing company for Wall Street? I think part of it is actually the modern media environment. There is, I mean, so just leaving Tesla aside for a second, why are there people that are vociferously in favor of not vaccinating their children? That's, that's something that is like, it doesn't make sense. There's not even financial incentive not to do it, right? So, so the, the, basically all of media is long volatility, right? If they can see something that's controversial, that gets amplified. Uh, and so uh, a, a second part is, is Elon Musk also is something of a, a you know, volatile figure <laughs> at times. And, and so um, kind of you combine those two together plus a lot of industry participants that have a strong vested interest in seeing them fail, and you get uh, a lot of combustion. Uh, and uh, I think it's interesting that uh, it, it's, it's very clear that he has actually restricted his use of Twitter at the behest of, of shareholders over the recent period. I think that um, you'll, you'll actually reach a period where he withdraws from the limelight some is my, what I anticipate. If you look at really, really driven CEOs, if you look at Steve Jobs, Jeff Bezos, they were good at um, basically having an internal message and an external message. And he so far has had basically a message that's the same internal and external. Uh, and uh, I think that he will increasingly meter kind of his, his external communications. One of the messages that he has had that he made clear both internally and externally was regarding LIDAR. And so uh, ARC has, I know, done the work on that and believes that LIDAR would be a mistake in self-driving. Why is that? I don't know if that's exactly the right way to classify our position. Uh, it, it's, it's more like if you ignore kind of the pragmatic factors of time to get to market and whether or not you can successfully get to market uh, given a budget and, and the practicality of getting robo-taxis to scale, um, you know, then sure, LiDAR, like why stop at LiDAR? Why not have infrared cameras? Like FLIR has a really interesting product. Clearly, if you could infrared, you might avoid like running over squirrels and humans. Um, so, and then why stop there? Why not have a drone that floats above every car and make sure you don't run over everything? Like you can layer on kind of cost and complexity into a system if you don't have a budgetary constraint or uh, a pragmatic constraint to how are you actually gonna solve the problem. To us, it's clear the critical path to autonomous taxi is what's called driving policy, which is as I'm clearing an intersection, the light's going from yellow to red, can I turn left or is that guy not gonna let me turn left and he's gonna T-bone me if I, if, if I turn? That's a really subtle negotiation. So how do you solve that? It's not by having you know, a spinning LIDAR on the roof of your car, it's, you need to see if a lot of examples of that kind of negotiation. You have to train your system on a lot of these really subtle and challenging to simulate um, situations. And that's what it, 
at least my view is, every Waymo cruise automation, um, the Argo AI, uh, they Zooks, they are uh, Zooks. <laughs> they've, 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 they've all run into a technological plateau at that driving policy step. LiDAR doesn't help you there. If it doesn't help you and it actually restricts the amount of data that you can get on that critical path, then it's the wrong technological solution. So. All right. Uh, let's, let's change, uh, we'll change directions here a little bit. A um, lot of media coverage, a lot of talking, bricks and mortar versus online. Amazon, we know, is planning to open more Amazon Go, the leading from the, from the online to the physical world. Uh, and it already has the food, Whole Foods in the, food, in the group as well. So with that as the backdrop, how should investors think about the relationship between online digital and offline stores? I think from, from a, you have to approach it from what's happening in the logistics supply chain. Um, so right now, if you use Postmates or Uber Eats, uh, it all translates into you're basically paying somebody $1.20 a mile to deliver you your stuff. Uh, and it so happens that that's most useful within the context of food because you want the food quickly, so you're willing to pay that additional amount for delivery. Uh, if you're ordering you know, clothing, then then People have like, decided they can wait at least a couple of days if they have Amazon Prime. Well, we think that the combination of, of autonomous drones and delivery robots is going to collapse that cost to deliver by, in the case of the little trundling robots, to something like six cents a mile. Uh, and so the, the entire um, relationship with the kind of retail footprint is going to change. Um, if you think about the, the way that you have your house configured and the fact that you go to the grocery store once a week, you go once a week because it's a pain to go back and forth. It takes you like an hour. You have to park in the parking lot. You haul out all the stuff. Then you have this big pantry that you fill full of all this stuff. You're basically like a little retail store inside your house, right? So if you could really cheaply get that stuff delivered, you would just do it daily. Uh, and so um, Amazon's strategy in particular is interesting, not only because they're investing in that logistics supply chain technology, but also because they're figuring out capital efficient ways to get that infill distribution that they'll need to accommodate kind of that change in consumer behavior and delivery. So there it's Amazon Go is an example, the Whole Foods acquisition is an example, these Amazon bookstores, which clearly they're not like intended to turn people back into going into regular bookstores and buying things, but it's to provide them with capital efficient um, retail square footage that ultimately will um, cement their distribution footprint for all of these kind of small trip distributions that we believe are gonna occur. Okay, another different one, and this one is this one pretty one pretty much sums up a questions that we get a lot. Uh, um, why so much optimism behind the crypto asset space and blockchain, uh, even though ten years in there isn't a real use case? Um, <laughs> okay, so imagine Tom that you are not Tom Stout, average citizen but Tom Stout, extremely wealthy on paper billionaire in an emerging market country that has like a kind of squishy view of rule of law. Okay. Right, okay. So uh, your billionaire status versus zero heir status is all contingent upon your relationship with kind of the political establishment in that country. Makes sense. Wouldn't you take some of your on paper billionaire hood and convert it into something that an event that your relationship went south you still would be maybe a multimillionaire. It's like an insurance product. If there's a one in a thousand chance that your assets are gonna be seized by state actors, the government, people with guns, in any given year, over 50 years, you probabilistically lose 5% of your net worth. Why not pre-lose it to an asset that prevents you from going totally flat broke in the event that that occurs. So in the US, high net worth individuals, they have uh, gold coins in a safe, right? And their plan is they have like a, a agreement with their private jet guy, I guess, to, to fly them to New Zealand, to their real estate they have there, and they're gonna hold the gold coins as they run to the plane. You know, there's like logistical challenges to that. What if someone takes the gold on the way to the plane? Uh, so this is a, a different mechanism by which to protect your wealth. Um, in the event that somebody tries to turn over the game board. So I basically disagree 
with the contention that there's no use case for crypto assets so far. There's a whole separate discussion about smart contracts and kind of the that whole distributed finance and, and that whole um, set of assets. And uh, there's a lot more kind of technical risk and implementation challenges there. But th within the cryptocurrency space itself, I think there's already utility for people. And you, know, you can make a very clear value case uh, given that utility. All right, next. What do you believe the future of video streaming services will be? We've certainly heard uh, Disney in particular has, has made moves to ch try to challenge Netflix. Where do you see that playing out? I think, well, first of all, I I believe that everybody's going to subscribe to a couple of these things, or most everybody. Um, that there is, um, you know, aggregation theory would say that the Netflix of the world and Disney, I think, will do very well as well. Will will collect, you know, a huge volume of consumers, and so then they'll be able to deliver them content. People often ask, like, why do they have to vertically integrate through production? Which I think is an interesting question. Um, Given what's happened with uh, what's happening with artificial intelligence and and content generation using um, generative adversarial networks, I actually think there's going to be more of a push into content verticalization in uh, in the streaming services. Meaning, so Netflix has just said they've invested a lot in animation. Um, you could imagine that they're actually going to go deeper into investing in the technical capability to produce content. So not just we're going to hire you know, great talent to write stuff for us, but we're actually going to invest in technology that allows us to produce compelling content less expensively. If you think about video content production, one of the big costs is the fact that you know, only one movie can have Brad Pitt at a time. Well, imagine if you could just duplicate Brad Pitt <laughs> across all of your movies. Right? And, and that's the direction we're going. And so, so kind of having the capability to do that and sure, you give Brad Pitt some royalty, but you don't. You can put him in any, everything, uh, and so the, <laughs> you know, or you know, pick your actor. But um, the, so 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 I think that the actual content generation and the technical capability to do that is going to change. And so the biggest content generator in the world is going to have the most resources to throw at R and D to be better at it. All right, we're going to try to hit a, the last couple of themes here for that our covers here before we wrap this up. So we'll focus on genomics. Certainly 23andMe, Ancestry.com, those grab the commercial headlines. Uh, but what's it going to take to shift from that, from, the, from that grade cl to clinical grade insights, the true potential? So this comes back to, to cost declines. Uh, if you look over the last 15 years, the cost to sequence the genome has fallen roughly a million fold. Um, but some, some cost declines are more meaningful than others. You know, being able to sequence a genome for $100 million is nice. $10 million is also nice, but it's still expensive. You know, so today we're at roughly $1,000, and we believe over the next five years we're going to get to less than $100. Uh, what's interesting about the move from $1,000 to $100 is you cross the price threshold of a lot of clinical diagnostic tests. Um, so with regards to the Ancestry.com and 23andMe type tests, those, are, they, those don't provide clinically actionable information because to do so uh, at the $1,000 genome type price, they would be too expensive for people to buy. Uh, and so as the cost comes down, um, you're actually going to have um, certainly exome sequencing, so sequencing the part of your genes that actually produce proteins, um, will become standard of care, we believe. Uh, and um, you, know, you can see companies uh, angling after this today. Uh, it's going to profoundly affect uh, certainly cancer care, but all kinds of um, uh, disease indications uh, where you're going to get a better readout of what's going on in your body, uh, and then that'll inform better treatment. All right, one last one, keeping you from uh, cocktail hours and refreshments, and that is digital wallets. Uh, according to the research ARC has, the digital wallet should be able to upend traditional bank branches. But the question that we often get as pushback is, what exactly stops banks and the incumbents from just acquiring their own alternatives to these digital wallets? Well, first of all, they're a little late. <laughs> like Venmo, if you count by number of deposit accounts controlled, Venmo and Square Cash are both top six banks in the U.S. Okay, so the... 
Uh, Venmo is number two. Square Cash is growing something like, I mean, we don't know exactly, but it's more than double year over year on the most recent data point. Uh, and so um, these banks, which are sitting on you know, fixed assets, uh, there's more than $100 billion in bank branch real estate. Uh, each bank branch costs a million dollars, and you have seven and a half employees assigned to it. Uh, when they build out a branch, they're basically pre-buying a set of customers. It's somewhere between $500 and $1,500 per customer acquired. So Square Cash and Venmo are acquiring customers at 20 bucks. Um, so uh, what's to stop them from acquiring those companies? Well, they'd have to pay a hefty price at this point. Uh, and then the, the, the go-to-markets for those kinds of companies have very strong network effects. You know, I can't get off Venmo because that's what my babysitter accepts. So, <laughs> I mean, you know, it, it's like, the, so, so it's, it's, it's very difficult to unseat and displace um, kind of those, um, those network effect applications once they're in place. The JP Morgan shut down Fin, which was its, its digital bank targeted at millennials. Um, you know, Venmo or Square Cash has been number one in the app store in finance for basically continually over the last three months. I think Fin never uh, cracked the top 250. So there's also just a bad uh, a DNA mismatch where they're, they're sitting there and saying, well, we, we can't profitably service these customers because our customer acquisition cost is too high. Whereas Venmo and Square Cash are saying, oh, we can get customers for $20. This is great. Um, so I expect, all right, one more. I, I know I'm out of time. One more point. OK, <laughs> there, given the number of ATMs that are in the US, imagine that we each, instead of having the ATMs distributed around, we each proportionately took our own chunk of ATM and had it in our house. Then we would each in our house have a box like this big that would spit out cash to us. It's like four times the size of a phone. We just have phones. <laughs> We're just going to have phones. <laughs> like, so, so I think. You know, in a world where you have a bank branch in your pocket, why do you need $100 billion plus of bank branches on the streets? You don't. I like it. Thank you, Brad. Uh, give a round of applause for Brad.